Welcome. Today I'm talking with Dorothy Lazard, the head librarian at the Oakland Public Library's History Room. She's the gatekeeper to a long list of books, periodicals, photos, and other documents that tell the rich history and story of our city. And we're here today to talk about Delilah Beasley. She's an American historian, author, newspaper columnist for the Oakland Tribune, and she was the first African-American woman to be published regularly in a major metropolitan newspaper, and she did it right here in Oakland. Welcome, Dorothy. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I'm glad that you're here. Can you tell me when and where Delilah Beasley was born? Delilah Beasley was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1871, although there are documents that say 1867. I cling to 1871. She was the oldest of five children and um, was very active in her community. Mm -hmm. I read that she started writing at the age of 12. Yeah, she started writing at the age of 12. She wrote for the Cleveland Gazette, which was a new black newspaper. By the age of 15, writing became an occupation for her because both her parents died within nine months of each other. And she was forced as the oldest in her family to take care of her younger siblings who were eventually kind of farmed out to uh, other relatives. Mm -hmm. And then how did she end up moving to California? She went to work as a nurse. Uh, She got training as a masseuse. Uh, She studied beauty culture. She continued to write uh, for local papers. And uh, she also studied hydrotherapy, uh, medical gymnastics, which we now call physical therapy. She had come west to California, to the Bay Area, to Berkeley, actually, to help a former client of hers um, who needed some physical therapy help. And it was there that she first encountered Oakland. Oakland had a large and thriving African-American community that piqued her interest. A year later, in 1910, she moved to Oakland, where she would remain for the rest of her life. We said she worked for the Oakland Tribune, but talk about the other paper that she worked for. She also worked for John Wiles. Uh, John Wiles was a the publisher of the Oakland Sunshine, which was the city's African-American newspaper. John Wiles was the city's first black employee. He worked at City Hall. He hired her to write a column, but by 1915, she was also contributing articles to the Oakland Tribune. Mm -hmm. And by 1923, she had her own column in the Trib. And can you talk about that column? Well, it was called Activities Among Negroes. Uh, she started it full-time uh, in 1923. And uh, in that column, she covered all kinds of uh, news uh, about African Americans, uh, about veterans, about uh, social clubs, scholarly uh, information, women's clubs. Uh, business advances that had happened in the community. So she was kind of all over the place going to uh, social club meetings, political meetings, uh, and also just bringing back information that she found out about from other journalists, from other uh, women uh, throughout the country, other writers throughout the country. And she certainly brought that back to Oakland. Mm -hmm. And her Column was widely read, and she was giving us a kind of a new way of looking at African Americans in her writing. And and she looked at it, she was kind of, her, I would say, self-appointed mission was to report the news not only to inform the African American community, but also to uplift the race. She was on this mission to not only inform us, but also to kind of bat down some of the stereotypes that were pretty common those, in those days. She said of her Tribune column, uh, here's a quote from her, the value of the column and book has always been to create a better understanding between the races. What do you think the column, what was its effect on its white readers? Or what do you think her, what she would want the effect to be on them? Well, I think 
she was really working always to dispel some of the stereotypes. She showed us such a kind of broad and diverse depiction of African Americans. And she wanted us to kind of know that we had, you know, skills and interests that went far beyond what was popularly depicted. That was her crusade. The written word was her crusade to basically just present kind of like a proud depiction of the Black community, which wasn't very common. Well, I think one of your questions was really interesting about how we uh, can kind of shape um, how people think about others through the written word. I think the Associated Press or New York Times this year has decided, you know, we're going to uh, capitalize B or capital, you know. Yeah, it was June of 2020. The Associated Press said we're now going to capitalize B in Black. Delilah was working in, you know, the 20s. And she did this um, whole thing of how do we get rid of derogatory words in the press? Mm -hmm. um, can mm -hmm. you talk about that sort of campaign that she she was doing? Well, she presented um, to a group of journalists. She was actually at a women's meeting, the International uh, Council of Women's Conference in Washington, D.C., where she was addressing her fellow journalists. And uh, many of them were from foreign countries, and they were also using the N-word, as we now call it, uh, which was fairly common in the 1920s and 30s. It wasn't rare to find that word written or spoken uh, across all uh, walks of life, you know, both in print and in real life. And so to this uh, congregation of journalists, um, she was denouncing the use of derogatory uh, language because she felt like that's holding us down as much as legislation, as much as racial violence. And so, uh, you know, derogatory words like nigger or pickaninny or darky, those are pretty common in the media of her day. And so uh, she was urging uh, journalists of the time to start uh, using more respectful language, stop using things that will be demeaning, words that would be demeaning. And I thought that was really uh, great. I was happy when I found that out. Um, because, you know, we ingest so much, uh, of how we look at people by the written word, you know, um, there was so much at that time that was so negative about African Americans, and she certainly didn't want to contribute to that. So she spent a lot of her time researching black life in California, right? I know she spent a lot of time at UC Berkeley in their archives. Um, and then this culminated in 1919 in her book, The Negro Trailblazers of California. Can you yeah. um, describe what that book was? Like, it's, it's unique in how, what it's made up of, um, but it's a compilation of quite a few things. So can you talk about that book? Absolutely. The Negro Trailblazers of California was an amalgam of statistics and photographs and historical uh, documentation, you know, just bits and pieces that would end up in her column. And so she trekked up and down the state doing research at the State Library in Sacramento, doing research as far south as the Huntington Library in San Marino, in places like Tulare County, where Allensworth, California is, which is a small uh, African-American town. Uh, she had worked for nine years on this book, nine years. And uh, eventually, in 1919, she published Negro Trailblazers. And the Negro Trailblazers, it was something that was a labor of love for her. She kind of uh, eroded her health in putting together this book, but it was a kind of a mon monumental physical and uh, scholarly effort on her part because 
uh, she had to go to all these places and pull all these things. But the interesting thing about when she was writing the book and when she was researching it is that there were still people alive for her to interview who were gold miners, who were former slaves. And she was always collecting things. She was kind of like a historic magpie in that way, and that there was always something to gather and glean. So by the time she sat down to write it, she certainly had a lot of information that she had been covering all along. And her book is amazing because it has stories going back to the 16th century Spanish explorers and early slavery in the state and how that was dealt with even before the white settlers came. So it's pretty amazing that she goes all the way back to Spanish explorer days pre, uh, you know, Junipero Serra. Uh, just fascinating work that she felt it was important to tell because she understood that African American people didn't come out here, you know, after slavery, they were already out here. Um, you know, centuries before. I think a lot of our viewers will be surprised by that fact. That, that people think that California, you know, in its inception was a free state and that slavery wasn't here. Um, can you just go into a little bit more detail about some of the things she reported on and what she found? She did relate the story of Archie Lee, which was a famous California legal case uh, 1857. There was a Mississippi slave who traveled to Sacramento with his master, and he was hired out for a year. And then after that year, when the master decided to leave the state, Archie Lee, the enslaved man, he refused to return to the plantation, and he actually escaped from the man who was charged to return him back to Mississippi. And so there was this long case that followed, and um, abolitionists raised en enough money to um, kind of support him through the course of the legal case. And he was finally allowed to stay in California as a free man. The conflict in California is that there was uh, this kind of ambivalence about uh, California being a slave state. People would bring their slaves here and go back south. Uh, with them. And so there was always this conflict about if you transport someone who's enslaved um, to California, does that impact their freedom? You know, are they going to be considered free if they're in a free state and they're, they came here not free? Mm -hmm. So there was always a conflict there. Can you talk about how her research for her book and her news article created a picture of African Americans in California? Oh, it totally uh, created a picture. Uh, and that was her goal, too. Uh, Delilah Beasley was using her uh, writing as a kind of activism, just letting us know that uh, the variety and the richness of African American life, even in the face of very strident segregation at the time. There's something about that segregated world that people lived in during Delilah's life that was, uh, on the one hand, deprived of a lot of civil liberties, but also very rich culturally, socially, if not economically, uh, because uh, African-American community which for us was mostly concentrated in West Oakland, was um, very diverse. You know, you had your doctors, lawyers, uh, business people living right next door to someone who may work in a rail yard or who might be a maid or something like that because of segregation. Mm -hmm. um, and she certainly captured that. She didn't spend a whole lot of time I, I think Delilah Beasley's work was more aspirational. Her writing was more aspirational. She focused on those people who would uplift 
the race. And that was a really key in her life, uplift the race. Uh, this is something that uh, W.B. Du Bois talked about, basically advocating for uh, better circumstances for African Americans. So, and you did talk about her health. Um, I mean, I, I can't imagine the like challenge of traveling at that time up and down the state. What that would, you know, what it would sometimes cost, what it would. What? Sometimes walking? walking from town to town. And and that certainly eroded her health and her, you know, just physic her anatomy, you know, just wearing her shoes out and 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 walking and the perils of a of a woman by herself going from these places, some of which were sundown towns, like why are you here? Very dangerous. Um the interesting thing to me about Delilah Beasley is that she kind of redefined for me what a pioneer is. You know, she redefined, uh, you know, that a pioneer could be a woman or a man. It could be a white person or a black person. Uh, it could be someone not from California. So for me, she kind of like opened up that sense of, you know, history could, can belong to anybody if you just pursue it. And she doggedly pursued the history of African-Americans in California. And so I just think it was interesting at that time when African-American women working outside of the home were either doing domestic work or agricultural work or, or something that she uh, kept herself going with her writing, um, probably stubbornly so. I'm guessing because there were a lot more opportunities to be someone's maid than to be someone's journalist, you know, you know what I mean? And so, um, I don't know. I, I feel like she's a pioneer, but in a very different way than, you know, John Muir or somebody like that. Right. right. Uh, or James Beckworth or something. Um, pioneering to kind of tell the story to kind of cement our place here. You know, if you have a history in a place, and in a lot of her columns, she's encouraging people to take a stand and uh, stake a claim and get involved in the workings of the city. Like she was really uh, an advocate of, you know, we should contribute to the community chess. We should help build the city. If they're doing, um, charitable work we should get invested in that mm -hmm. because we need to show them that we are an integral part of the city and its operations mm -hmm. so tell me about some of the civic organizations that she was a part of sure uh the black women's uh club movement was made up of mostly middle class married women uh, who were working to kind of provide educational and vocational and artistic and political training to the black community. Uh, during Delilah's life, uh, that whole uh, lifting as they climb ethos was very dominant. Um, certainly Delilah Beasley practiced her act activism through uh, the various clubs that she became involved with. For example, the California State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. She was an officer in that organization. Uh, and that organization, by the way, held their uh, annual conference in Oakland in 1915. She was also a uh, vice president of the Alameda County League of Colored Women uh, Voters. And this was a group that educated women on political issues and uh, things like the importance of voting. Uh, this organization actually met regularly at the Linden Street YWCA. And that was a really active organization that Delilah Beasley was also involved in. They provided housing, they provided job training, uh, cultural events, they had teas. So they, they were doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, the Linden Street Y was regularly in the paper, not just in Delilah Beasley's columns. She was also a member of the Fanny Jackson Coppin Club. This was an organization that was founded in the turn of the century, like in 1899, 
by the women of the Beth Eden Baptist Church. The club also hosted lectures, and they were also a philanthropic agency for the community. And uh, the Coppin Club, their motto was not failure, but low aim is the crime, which kind of, kind of gives you an, a sense of uh, this kind of, um, I would say very middle class, aspirational uh, sort of involvement. Delilah was also involved, uh, an active member of the NAACP, as you can imagine, uh, the Public Welfare League of the Alameda County. She was also in the Council of uh, the Alameda County Council of Church Women. Uh, Delilah Beasley also got involved with the Panama Pacific uh, International Expo that was held in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the World's Fair, right? That was the World's Fair that was held in the what we now know of as the Marina District of San Francisco. And uh, it was very glorious. I mean, scores of blocks were occupied by these temporarily built buildings that were very grand and palatial. And there was a day set aside for African Americans and a day set aside for people from Alameda County. So they had these certain days. Um, the ironic thing, and she writes about this in Negro Trailblazers, the Oakland Tribune had a contest to name the fair. The uh, prize was to, you get to go to the fair, and, you know, free admission for you and who, your family and so forth. As it turns out, 12-year-old Oakland girl won uh, Virginia Stevens. Uh, she named it the Jewel City, which it absolutely was if you've ever seen pictures. And once they found out that she was African-American, you know, all of the prizes uh, were kind of pulled or reduced. Hmm. You know, she did get to go, but not, uh, she didn't get the whole swag bag, as, as it were, of prizes. And Delilah Beasley wrote about that. She wrote about unfair, uh, a lot of unfairness that happened to African Americans uh, with not a lot of vitriol. Mm -hmm. that some of those incidences would um, would call for, I would think. Mm -hmm. But um, it's those kinds of things. And uh, I've also seen pictures from that fair of, you know, African-Americans being dunked in bodies of water, you know, like, you know, the dunking mm -hmm. thing, you throw a ball and you hit a target and then you dunk someone. And also there was this whole eugenics part of it. And it was it was problematic. Mm -hmm. It was very problematic. What my understanding is that Birth of a Nation and the World Fair were happening kind of simultaneously yeah. and yeah. that she was reporting really excellent portrayals of African Americans at the fair that she was mm -hmm. writing about sort of juxtaposing with the screening yes. of A Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation, which ran here for a very long time. Uh, and if your listeners don't know, it was a um, a film by D.W. Griffith, very epic film, very classic film in um, film history. And it ended up being a recruiting film for the Klan. It showed these very derogatory uh, depictions of African Americans post-Civil War uh, during uh, Reconstruction, which when African Americans had been given not only emancipation, but uh, citizenship rights and the, and black men given the rights to vote. That was all depicted in this film in a very derogatory way. So she wrote, right, in the paper a big article saying we recommend that you don't screen don't this go in see town this, yeah. and don't go see it. What she, were the other ways that she was um, sort of countering this screening? Uh, well, just uh, speaking against uh, against it and how it would uh, incur violence is what she and a lot of uh, local leaders, uh, local African-American leaders and uh, ministers feared uh, that it would, um, you know, foment 
some kind of violence against the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Um, What I thought was interesting about her columns, too, is that she reported the things that were happening in other newspapers across the country and kind of giving us a sense of what we're dealing with here isn't just happening here. It's happening, and it kind of built a understanding, a coalition uh, of we're not in this alone. We have allies. Uh, these are people we can reach out to because they're coping with the same things. Is her book still available today? Can people read it? It's online now at the Internet Archive, archive.org. And I've bought it a number of times (laughs) because it's a book actually uh, in the library that gets stolen. So, so I've had to buy it a number of times. It's considered essential. Mm -hmm. And even though the editor of the Journal of um, Negro History, Carter G. Woodson, who is the guy who created Black History Month, he uh considered it not serious scholarship he felt like it was too much of a hodgepodge of stories Mm -hmm. but you know other reviewers thought it had really sound historical value and it was going to be valuable to students of sociology and and thank god it uh reached um 100 years old and and still is able to be put in people's hands you know just her personal sacrifices, you know, she never married, she didn't have kids. Uh, you know, that book, The Negro Trailblazers, was her baby. Mm-hmm. To, and that, you know, that's major. Yeah, yeah. That's major. It's a huge, huge contribution. How are yeah. we continuing her legacy? I know there's a group that does the Delilah Beasley Tea. The Tea started in 2012. Mm-hmm. Every year they have a tea, and they're, the one I went to was in 2015 uh, at the Pardee home mm-hmm. um, on 11th and Castro. And over those years, each year they honor another woman uh, from the community who's doing things to improve the life of her community. Uh, and they come from different walks of life. You know, some are lawyers, some are community activists, uh, some are artists, uh, art, you know, art gallerists. Uh, Belva Davis, the journalist Belva Davis has been honored. Anyway, this group, it was an ad hoc group of women founded in 2012, and they formed the Progressive Oakland Women's Empowering Reform or Power organization. I hope they continue. I thought it was a great idea, and I love that they honored her. You can't do enough to honor her. I I think her legacy is very strong, and I'm happy to see, you know, people like uh, Isabel Wilkerson, who are writing these fantastic, engaging, scholarly histories on different aspects of African-American life, Mm -hmm. which tell... uh, our country story, not just an African American story. And I think that's where the evolution has come from, uh, that we can hearken back to Delilah for, because while she's telling an African American story, she's really telling a very universal story. Well, thank you, Dorothy, for being with us today and sharing your wealth of information. And you've really brought to life Delilah Beasley. It's been a joy. Thank you. It was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. It was so much fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.